Yep, sounds good. Yep. Okay, well, welcome everyone um, to our second Citizen Science Lunchtime uh, seminar. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging uh, that I'm hosting this, uh, this meeting from the lands of the Gunai Kurnai people in uh, a lovely East Gippsland. Um, I also want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands um, on which you are meeting with us today too. Uh, I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and, and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples uh, and their ongoing culture and connections to the land and waters of Australia. So today, today the, we're hearing from um, Jack Nunn from Science for All. And uh, before I uh, introduce Jack, I just wanted to highlight some of the, the goals of these, these lunchtime seminars. And really what we're trying to do here is to unite citizen science researchers from around Australia um, by providing them a space to share in some new developments in this really growing field of, of citizen science research uh, here in Australia. Um, we also hope these seminars create opportunities for collaboration, um, to meet and network with, with uh, like-minded people and also discuss some challenges that uh, you may be experiencing um, in this really rapidly expanding field. The structure of these seminars really is separated into two parts. The first is a research presentation. Um, and that will be delivered today by Jack. Um, and then following that, we have uh, a discussion. Um, you know, what can we learn from this community? What do we want to learn? Um, who do we need to talk to? What are some of our challenges and, and how do we overcome these? And today that discussion will be facilitated by um, Anne Border from the University of Melbourne. There's many ways for you to be involved as well. We, we really encourage you, if you'd like to, to join our, um, the organizing team for these seminar series. Um, you're also welcome to join in on the EMCR working group as well. Um, for those of you who are interested in presenting as well, we've uh, created a form in which you can uh, uh, express your interest in presenting uh, at one of these seminars. Um, and I'm hoping that Yala can, or, or someone else can, uh, or I'll do so in the chat at some point to um, highlight the link to that form so you can uh, let us know that you're interested in um, presenting some of your work. And then finally, before I introduce Jack, um, some upcoming events. Our next seminar series will be hosted by uh, Debbie gonzalez Canada, uh, and Debbie will be sharing some um, in insights into her PhD research with frog and bird monitoring volunteers. Uh, discussing opportunities for participant recruitment, training, um, and also the synergies between online citizen science and face-to-face and -face, uh, projects. And that will be happening on the th uh, Thursday, May, th May the 6th, so next month. Um, and then following that, we have a joint seminar with uh, the EMCR Working Group and Science for All, of which uh, Jack uh, is the director of. Um, we haven't yet... Uh, 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 formed, you know, who we're going to have uh, speaking at, at, at that seminar. So if you do have any suggestions about who you would like to, to hear from at, at this joint seminar, then please get in touch. Um, there is also some funding available for, for that initiative. So I'd just like to introduce Jack. Um, Jack is the Director of uh, Science for All and is also a PhD student uh, at La Trobe University, uh, looking into um, uh, around uh, involving people in, in genetics uh, research. Thank you very much. Take it, take it away, Jack. Um, just confirming people can hear me and see a slide that says Science for All with a picture of a, a genome made out of people. Can people see that? Good. Thanks, Maureen, for the double thumbs up. Um, and it's a small group today, which is, which is lovely. So thank you all for joining. This will be recorded and shared as well, but um, we'd really like to try and tailor this as much as possible to those of you um, who are able to be here today and, and participate in the discussion. So uh, thank you very much um, for those of you who are here. So let's see if I can go to the next slide. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna be talking today about what do we mean when we say citizen science um, and, and participatory action research? And I'm gonna talk about uh, real examples that I've been involved in um, and um, explain ways of planning, reporting and evaluating the process and outcomes and impacts. Um, 
and I've put some outcomes <laughs> because um, it's these are the things I hope you'll learn. But basically, um, the main thing is is I want to talk about how participatory, rate, participatory research can be planned, reported, and evaluated, and talk about a way that we're developing uh, called standardized data on initiatives uh, that we'd also welcome all of you to be involved in. Um, so that's sort of the structure of today. But um, my slides are changing without me, which is a cue to stop talking. Um, so yeah, this is basically the timings. I, I'm going to try and keep it to under 30 minutes. In fact, I'm aiming for 20. We'll see how we go. Um, but the main focus of this is a um, an open discussion. So just um, very briefly, who am I? I'm director of Science for All. Uh, which is a charity that I started a couple of years ago, um, working to involve everyone in shaping the future of, of human knowledge. So big ambitions, small budget, I sort of summarise science for all as at the moment. Um, and then I'm just finishing a PhD in public health genomics at the moment. I'll speak more about that. And just my background is I've been working for over 10 years to involve patients in the public in health and social care research. And um, really, it's been in the last sort of five years that I've been looking at what lessons can we learn from what's sometimes called public involvement in research in the health world and how can that be implied to the environmental sector and when you're looking at things like air pollution for example is it a health problem is it an environment problem these sectors need to start talking together better and certainly better in terms of who is involved in doing what and how and that's certainly some of the things that I've been thinking about uh, and want to talk about today. Um, another thing I don't normally mention because a lot of people don't get excited about health technology assessment, but I do. Uh, and I think, um, so I just wanted to mention I'm also on the Medical Services Advisory Committee, and uh, I also do work with uh, Cochrane as well. So for the health people in the room, uh, that's just other things I, I'm interested in. I wanted to say this, an expert is in the eye of the beholder. I am very aware that many of the people on the call today, and in fact, maybe watching this recording, are going to know a lot more about participatory research, about citizen science than I do. Um, I don't consider myself an expert. Um, and in fact, there are many people who know a lot more about this. However, I consider myself a practitioner. Um, participatory action research in its very nature requires you to actually get out from behind your desk and do something. Um, so in the spirit of, of that participatory um, method or paradigm, I've, uh, I've done that in my PhD and we're doing that with Science for All. So I'm gonna talk about how I've tried to do participatory research. So I'm speaking today from my own experience and the lessons I've learned from that and hopefully um, how, how we can report that kind of data from these participatory processes and um, the sort of thought starters and discussion starters for later on. Um, I just wanted to ask in the chat if you could share who's in the room. Um, I'm aware you're all muted, which does seem a bit rude. Um, but um, if you could, or are wanting to share in the chat, just a little bit about um, who you are, how you describe yourself, maybe a researcher, uh, a citizen. Uh, for example, I'm a permanent resident, so can I do citizen science? I don't know. Um, and, and maybe what you're doing. Um, and please share anything in particular hoping to learn from this session. And then a question and a discussion that Anne will, will focus much more towards the end is, what kind of data would you most like to be able to find or share? Um, and we can certainly get down into that question a lot more. And, and anything else you'd like to learn. So let's just try and define citizen science. I like uh, Wikidata because anyone can edit it. It's a participatory form of structured data. And so this was the definition I found whether we agree with it or not is, um, is for discussion. So it's scientific research conducted in whole or in part by amateur or non-professional scientists. Um, and instantly we're getting into labels, aren't we? Uh, it, I do a lot of research that I'm not paid for. Does it mean I'm an amateur? Uh, it, you know, if I, you know, if I play music for free, am I, I'm an amateur musician. If I get paid, suddenly I'm professional. That's more an issue of research funding rather than skill. So, these definitions really need digging down into. So I'm gonna frame citizen science within participatory action research. And the reason for that is because participatory research is an umbrella term which, which describes a number of related approaches. My favorite definition is this Wikidata definition, uh, which actually I wrote. 
uh, and adapted from Involve, which is the National Institute for Health Research in the UK. And they describe it as an approach to research where research is carried out with people rather than on them. And that's an important distinction. Um, related terms to um, participatory action research include things like community-based participatory research, co-design, forms of public involvement, or, um, or citizen science, or, and of course in, in health, Australians are fond of the term consumer or consumer involvement. But I wanted to say um, it's important to mention that it's not a method. There's no sort of participatory action research method. It's more a paradigm, to, to use a jargon term. It's, it's more a set of values that can shape an approach you will take to research, which is effectively asking the question, how will you share power? Um, I see we've got a few responses in the chat. So I, I can't um, read all these now out, but it's really interesting to see the things that you're, you're working on. And so thank you very much to those of you who shared that. Um, this is a picture of a water pump. It's quite a famous one uh, if, <laughs> if you're interested in public health. Um, participatory action research is an approach to research that emphasizes participation and action, and it seeks to understand the world by trying to change it collaboratively. A guy called John Snow was trying to figure out the cholera outbreak in London in the 1800s and figured out that basically um, it was a particular water pump that, that had cholera. And rather than just sort of writing a paper and publishing it and going, yes, I've found out this is the water pump that's killing lots of people. He went and took the handle off so people couldn't use it. That is the action part of the research. It is the intervention. Um, uh, interestingly, you know, he actually, they actually put the handle back on and th there was disbelief at the kind of uh, what's called fecal bacteria oral route uh, for cholera that people just didn't believe at the time. So there were also kind of values and um, beliefs in the scientific community, dogmas, if you like, that were dominant uh, and challenged Jon Snow's findings. Of course, the data backed him up and, and in retrospect, he was a, a pioneer of what we today call public health. Um, but I think that's a really important example, and that, that's actually left as a monument to, to what he did. The point of participatory action research is it's collective inquiry and experimentation. Um, and the definition from, from Wikipedia is that it's communities of inquiry and action, and they evolve and address questions and issues that are significant for those who participate as co-researchers. So that can be, um, you know, what frogs are living here, as we'll hear from in the next uh, seminar, or it can be is this air safe to breathe? Uh, is this water safe to drink? What's the biodiversity here? How can we improve it? All of these are, are questions, but you, you need to involve people in, in prioritizing those questions, identifying different questions, and in fact, the whole stage of that research cycle, which I'll come to. Um, I won't bore you with the history of critical pedagogy, but I do just want to uh, share Paolo Freire with you because he's, um, he's a really interesting person who kind of, links the idea of knowledge to being a kind of uh, almost an inherent part of democracy and, and in fact how you teach people and how you teach people to ask a question empowers them and helps everyone be involved in, in shaping our knowledge. Um, and he said to see the world not as a static reality but as a reality in process, in transformation. Um, and this is, a, this is a little diagram I like adapted from a World Health Organization paper from the 90s and it looks at time as a kind of um, cone of possibility. Uh, and basically, there are plausible preferred futures and plausible unpreferred futures. You know, for example, uh, both it's plausible that we could have irreversible climate change, and it's plausible that we could pause or reverse it. Those things are both possible. The, the choices and decisions we make now as a species will determine those futures. And I think for me, participatory action research is involving people and asking those questions. Where do we want to go? And actually, different people are going to want to go to different places sometimes. Uh, there's no right or wrong. Um, there, there, there's data and there's facts. But there's also what we don't know. There's culturally induced ignorance. There's all these different power structures. So what I'm trying to do with my work is, um, alongside many others, I hasten to add, is evidence-informed participatory research. So at the moment, there's no standardized way to describe how people have been involved in participatory research or citizen science, or to report the impacts of involving people. 
Um, for example, in the 2019 scoping review about public involvement in genomics research, we concluded that there'd be significant value in developing a more systematic method of both reporting and evaluating how people are involved in research. Um, and data from such reporting could provide the evidence to inform future policy. So in other words, um, you know, should we have webinars on a, on a Wednesday morning uh, and, and get people involved that way? Or actually, is it better to have a face-to-face -face event or a mixture of those things? And of course, the truth is you've actually got to involve people uh, who you want to involve in co-designing, how are you gonna involve them? And that is complicated and people needing to do that require evidence to make informed decisions. And at the moment, there isn't any data really to make those decisions. And certainly it's very difficult, if not impossible to do systematic reviews at the moment. So that's why we created standardized data on initiatives to try and solve this issue and to try and work across disciplines, whether it's health, environmental research, policy, um, manufacturing, what have you. How, who was involved, who did what, who funded it, et cetera. And I'll get more into the nitty gritty. So yeah, it's basically the who, how, what, and why of initiatives. And, um, and it's built in Wikidata at the moment. We're working with the Wikimedia Foundation and a number of other partners. Uh, it's all open access and anyone can edit the data, anyone can add to it. Um, I think the, the, the difficulty I have with Start is I can talk about it all day. So I will leave it there for now, but I'm very happy to answer questions on structured data or how it works, et cetera. But that's what it's trying to do. I'll talk very briefly now about my um, PhD uh, and how I've used Start It in that, just as an example of how it can be applied. So uh, the, I worked on four case studies as part of my PhD. So the first one was with Australia's largest clinical trial, the Esprit trial. There's about 17,000 Australians involved and many of them have um, their genome sequenced. And the idea was, well, this starting cohort, this population could contribute to probably what could be one of the largest multi-generational studies on earth. Uh, but they weren't sure what the current participants thought about that. So we co-designed a process where we involved current participants in helping us shape what a multi-generational study could look like. And we used started to report how we involve people, what methods, for example, face-to-face -face events, and what the outcomes and impacts of that were. Um, the Aboriginal Personalised Medicine Project uh, is another one where we worked with um, a remote Aboriginal community in New South Wales. And the idea was that because of uh, biases in the data we have, you know, people with uh, European or Asian ancestry are overrepresented in, in genomic databases worldwide. So that if, you know, indigenous peoples, for example, around the world are underrepresented, which means precision medicine is not as precise uh, for those people. So this was a study working with local people to say, we're thinking about doing this research with you. Um, how would you like it done? How would you like to be involved? How would you like to control the data? Very important questions. And um, what we were able to do was write a started report about that, saying how we were going to involve people. So almost like a protocol or a perspective um, way to say, you, we plan to involve these people in this way, or, or these stakeholders, to use the, the term stakeholders. Um, also working with a, a community people affected by a rare disease and uh, half siblings who share the same sperm donor father, used an online community with those people to actually ask about their preferences for involvement in research and to inform future research. Uh, I don't really have time today to tell the story of the half siblings one, uh, but basically after starting my PhD, I thought I'd better do my own DNA test and um, found out that my mother was actually uh, conceived by uh, a sperm donor, which we didn't know, and that that sperm donor had conceived possibly up to 600 other people. So uh, suddenly I had a lot of half aunts and uncles and a lot of cousins. So potentially find myself part of one of the largest single ancestor cohorts on earth, which was unexpected. And uh, we're, I was able after a lot of ethical deliberation and ethics approval to work with my family to actually explore how they might want to be involved in shaping research that's done with them. So it's a bit of sort of personal experience or as, as my supervisor Paul Lacaz says, I've got a bit of skin in the game for that one. So those are the four case studies. Now, the difficulty there was how do I talk about those four very different projects in the same way? And that's why uh, Start It was used for that. Um, so that's sort of my PhD. Whilst 
doing my PhD, I <laughs> decided to start Science for All and had been running a project called Campfires and Science, where I found out uh, after moving to Australia about six years ago about the, the mass extinctions happening in this country um, as a direct result of human action. Um, you know, let's not say species loss, let's say destruction of habitat, because that's what it is. Um, for example, in the Central Highlands north of Melbourne, uh, the old growth forests there uh, are the most carbon dense on Earth. Um, and there's a number of critically endangered species. They, they generate a lot of water security for Melbourne. There's a lot of reasons that you'd want to keep those old growth forests there. And they're being cut down to make office paper and you know, sawdust for, for chickens and, and baking bricks and stuff. Um, there's, there's less than, well, there's around 1% of the original old growth forest left. So how can we save it? And the approach we took with Science for was a participatory action research project where we actually involved people in co-designing the project. And the idea was to actually see, could we use environmental DNA to find presence or absence data of endangered species? Because otherwise you have to kind of follow them around with infrared cameras at three in the morning because a lot of them are nocturnal, which is very exciting, but not inclusive or accessible. So that was the Wild DNA project, and it's and it's in progress still. And you know we've been able to uh, involve all sorts of people in going out and collecting samples and um, and analysing them in the lab. And it's been a really exciting project. And I'm very happy to answer more questions about that if people want to know more. But the um, this is just a photo I really like, which is uh, Ziggy who who found a sugar glider, and what he's handing in there is a mosquito trap where we were trying to find. Um, blood from from the species we're looking for that was in mosquitoes a bit jurassic park what we learned that night in fact was it was easier to get bitten by mosquitoes than it is to catch them um and uh, that little box on the table is a box of toffee which is just to get you thinking about the rewards you might want to offer people for participating in citizen science and how that can be done ethically or you know is a box of toffee enough should these people be paid um and these are questions i'll come to and i just don't, as I mentioned, I don't normally talk about health technology assessment. No one wants to be stuck at the dinner party next to the person talking about that. Um, I find it a very interesting subject, and it's and I think COVID-19 has changed the world in a lot of ways. And, and one of them is that many more people are now asking questions like, well, who decides which vaccines we buy? And what evidence is there for effectiveness? In fact, for spelling poor correctly. Um, are there any conflicting or competing interests? These are really important questions that governments around the world have been working on for decades, uh, but the public are more aware of the importance of these now, I think because of COVID. Um, so, but I think what we need is better evidence on how to effectively involve the public in that process, whether it's scrutinizing it or being involved. And there's a lot of work being done to do that and, and, and start it's been designed to, to help that process too. I'm just going to share a few reflections um, and things that can be reported about participatory research or citizen science using started. Um, I think a really important question is who's involving who? You know, when we went to work with the Aboriginal community, it, it's really important to go in and make sure you're not part of that legacy of frankly bad research, which has been done on people uh, in Australia, in particular Aboriginal peoples. Um, and you know, there's still huge systemic racism in Australia. It's a massive, massive issue. And there's no simple solution. But I think for me, as a researcher coming into a community, it's, it's, it's a power relationship and you have to acknowledge it. Words like participation and involvement can mean different things to different people and can imply very different power relationships. I prefer to ask the question, who's working with who, how and why, and who's not involved? And who is a stakeholder? Who has a stake in this research and, and who doesn't? All of that kind of data can be reported with, with um, Stardip. I also wanted to quote um, Tyson Yonke Potter, who wrote a book, Sand Talk, which I really would recommend all of you to read. Um, and he talks about motivation and values with the research. And I think, you know, whether you're, you identify as a researcher or someone just helping out with a project, check your ego and your motives. You don't need to be an expert to understand the knowledge and processes of people from other cultures, but understanding your own culture and the way it interacts with others, particularly in the power dynamics of it, is far more appreciated. And that, for me, I think is a very helpful way to, to look at participatory research. I mentioned the box of toffee. Um, I, I'm not addicted to sugar, I promise. 
Um, how are people being valued? Is their time or expertise valued? Are some people involved paid and others not? You get this a lot with health research, you know, where the clinicians or, or health researchers are being paid to be at a meeting and the, you know, the patient representatives aren't. Um, is there a parity there? Why has that decision been made? Who made those decisions? And are people supported in other ways too? You know, do they need training to be involved? Is, is there a need for emotional support? Um, these are all important things to ask. And on that as well, I think boundaries are really important to report about participatory research. I won't go through all these in detail, but you know, who's doing what? Why? What isn't being done? And, and with the support as well, who's accountable for, for, for providing this? I mean, you know, we, we took on six student placements last year before COVID to help us with the Wild DNA project. And, you know, COVID was a difficult time for a lot of people, and it obviously still is. Um, some of those student placements needed a, a lot of different kinds of support, um, practical, emotional, financial. Some of it was within the remit of science for all to offer, and some of it wasn't. And it's really important to, to be very clear about that at the start of a project. And so those expectations are, um, are you know, understood. And there's a, there's a resource called the six R's um, that are, where that goes into more detail. And I should say, I'll provide a link at the end, but everything I'm saying today there's references um, to all of it in an accompanying accompanying PDF, uh, with which is on the Science Rule website, scienceforall.world forward slash events, and I'll share that link later. Communication as well. I think the sort of winding up now. The, the main thing to say from doing participatory research is there's no magic tool or trick for communication. You know, there's no one solution to, that will work. It's hard work. It's trial and error and evaluation from reported data. But I will say that co-creating how you communicate is important. You can't, you know, you can't impose your preference for doing everything on Zoom if everyone else would prefer to get around a campfire or vice versa. You have to ask the people you're hoping to involve what their preferences are. And those boundaries help create safe, inclusive and supportive communication spaces. And once you have that, everything else will follow. And, and you know, the importance of safe online spaces is, is more important than ever. Um, and I should say as well, while Science for All uh, tries to be open and transparent, that's our values, um, you know, share everything with everyone. There is a really important lesson about also creating spaces for confidential discussion. Um, that's very important too. So agreeing when things need to be confidential and, and, and how. Otherwise you can, you know, possibly uh, create tensions between um, uh, people who maybe don't understand why some things are being redacted or what have you. And, and that's an important part of data sharing too. Um, I mean, we're collecting data about sensitive, critically endangered species. You know, we can't just publish that GPS location online. We have to redact that data. And that's certainly something that Stardust looking at too, which is who decides what data is redacted or, or made vague in plain English. Um, and how is that process actually managed? Um, so yeah, other things that can be reported about participatory research that's, that's relevant to citizen science, you know, who's accountable, who isn't. And if there is power in decision-making, for example, on, on redacting data, label it. Just say this person makes this decision. And, and distributing decision-making can work. You know, participatory action research is difficult. Um, it can work, but, but for some things, for Science for All I've learned, for example, you know, at the end of the day, I, my signature is on the grant and I'm legally accountable to deliver on that. So at certain, certain things it works to sort of distribute, other times, you know, one has to just make decisions and, and sort of direct things. So a, a woman working with Science for All with me said to me once, well, as director, sometimes you have to be direct. And uh, that really stuck with me. So, but trying to do that in a way that isn't imposing your beliefs or values, it's a challenge. And, and I'm just gonna ask this question in bold, which came out of my PhD, and, and that's one for really you to think about. Who decides who decides what is ethical? That's a, that's a year long seminar in itself. And just finally, I think using tasks, not roles to describe what needs to be done can help keep things focused. If you, if you start doing role descriptions, it can get quite vague. Whereas if you say, I'd like you to do this thing, that can be more precise. And that's certainly one thing you can report in, in Start It. Um, so I think really the, um, 
the main thing to say is that start it can also be used to help plan and report citizen science and involvement in research and i won't talk too much about this and i hope you can all read this slide because i'm aware it's probably low resolution this is basically the research cycle idea sharing prioritization designing doing um, implementing and evaluating there's lots of different versions of this but the point is at every stage you can do a start it report and actually say this is what we're planning to do like we did with the indigenous project um indigenous precision medicine project what we're planning to do and then actually you can update that report and say well actually after involving people um you know you can actually have this design cycle so you can actually refine the design with different stakeholders and say how you did that you can do preference mapping what's different stakeholders preferences Sometimes researchers prefer to do everything online and Zoom, and maybe the local community prefers to do everything face to face. There's different preferences. You need to make sure they're mapped and incorporated into how the project's planned. So start it can be used to report all these different stages. Um, start it itself um, has been co-created by many people around the world who've been involved in online discussions, face to face events, uh, webinars like this. And we've, we've published a couple of preprints, and we've, we've got people from, from Cochrane, Wikimedia Foundation, Johns Hopkins University, Health Research Authority UK, Host Centre for Indigenous Health, and, and many more, and many universities. And, and I'm pleased to say Anne, as well, who'll be leading the next session, is, is a, is a co-author too. We're only just getting started. Uh, we invite um, all of you to get involved in, in Start It. It's only going to work if multiple people help improve it. Um, and I should just say as well, Standardized data initiatives, it's not a new data standard. There's, there's probably at least three people in the world that I've found at the moment who, who think they've got the gold standard for reporting patient involvement in research or reporting citizen science. The idea of Starter is that it aligns with all these data standards and they can work and plug into it. It's not a new standard. It's actually meant to work and interoper work interoperably with other standards. Um, and I should have said that sooner. So that's me finished broadcasting and talking at you. Just in conclusion, um, before we go into and um, facilitating the next session, it would be very interesting to hear if you have any thoughts um, or ideas about standardized data on initiatives. Um, it would be also interesting to discuss what is impact, how do we measure it, and who is we, if you want to get really meta. Um, We'll share some links in the chat for you to share feedback and get involved. And just to mention that link to the resources is just there. So if you did want to download a kind of a lengthy uh, transcript of what I've just said with references, um, that's at scienceforall.world forward slash events. So that's everything from me. Thank you for your attention. And I'm really looking forward to a discussion with you all. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jack. That was a really fascinating presentation. Um, I've heard you speak about Startup quite a bit over the years, and um, this is the first time that I've actually uh, sat through an entire presentation, and, and, and I did learn so much about um, the importance of standardising um, the, the information around participatory action research. Um, I have many questions, uh, particularly about the sort of the similarities and differences that you've found uh, working in um, in both the health sector, but also the environmental space as well. But before I get to that, I wanted to just relay one of Anna Christie's questions about boundaries. You mentioned boundaries before, and um, uh, Anna just wanted you to explain a little bit more about boundaries. Yeah, boundaries, I mean, it's a word, uh, and I would define it in this context as a kind of a mutually agreed um, uh, boundary. So, Alan Watts said something, and I'm going to paraphrase it dreadfully, but in, the, in other words, it's boundaries that connect things because actually all boundaries are shared. So whether that is saying, well, this is, this is health research and this is environmental research, and I'd go, well, actually air pollution works across those conceptual boundaries. That's, that's one boundary. So we've got to recognize when language and linguistic conventions are carving up reality. You know, today's Wednesday, but it doesn't have to be called Wednesday. It's just a day. It's a helpful label, but it doesn't mean it is any more real than an idea. That's, that's one way to talk about boundaries. Another way is in terms of um, interpersonal relationships. So, uh, for example, uh, let's say you go to your GP. There's very clear boundaries there, aren't there? Uh, your GP, you expect, will keep things confidential. And in fact, that's a legal requirement, but 
if you know you tell your GP something like maybe you're feeling suicidal, your GP is you know maybe obliged to break that confidentiality out of a duty of care. So that's a really extreme example. Uh, and, and apologies to anyone working as a GP if I've got that wrong, but it was more just a sort of a concept of there has to be some kind of mutually agreed process in place about who knows what, who does what, who gets supported and how, who's getting paid and who isn't. And I think all of those can be thought of as, as boundaries. Does that answer that question? Hope so, hope not. Um, it's a very good discussion. Yeah, and I think the other thing too is that boundaries are not rigid and stable. They're they dynamic, they shift, they move, and they're influenced by people's behaviours and actions. That's the other sort of um, part of part of that uh, that that issue. Does anyone uh, and of course, look, we 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 did an acknowledgement at the start of this presentation uh, of the you know the of the Aboriginal peoples in Australia. Well, often people will add to that sovereignty was never ceded. Now. You have to recognize the rule of law as a sort of a Western European tradition that has been imposed on cultures around the world, including Aboriginal Australians. Now, they have their own systems of law, L-A-W and L-O-R-E. It's not to say one's wrong or right, but you have to recognize those are different ideas of, of ethical and moral boundaries. Yeah. So I might open it up to other questions. Would would other people like to ask Jack a question about his research or um, his his past experience in Science for All? Uh, start it. Otherwise, I um, I have a couple of questions, Jack, um, and it goes to you know how your your experience with working in the both the health and environmental space and the similarities and differences that you've found working in that and perhaps talking to uh, how Startup works in those different contexts, um, but also your experiences with people, um, you know, as part of that uh, action research. Yeah, um, I'll give a short answer. I mean, I started working in this space when I worked for a cancer charity. So we used to run a course called Building Research Partnerships where um, the idea was, well, hey, if you're trying to help people affected by cancer, maybe you need to ask them what their needs are. And so you get researchers, cancer researchers, in the same room as people affected by cancer and get them to talk to each other. And so that was the concept of building research partnerships. And there's a lot of evidence um, that, you know, if you involve people, patients, stakeholders, whatever, in co-designing research or in shaping it somehow, it improves the research, it improves the outcomes, it improves the acceptability, and basically just makes the research better. Of course, that's a subjective judgment, but that's a really important principle and I remember I met my friend who was working as a primatologist in Borneo, and I had this kind of light bulb moment where I said, well, what, what's the biggest threat to orangutans? You know, she was working on orangutans and um, the, the Borneo Nature Foundation. We're doing fantastic work to understand their behaviors, et cetera. But I said, well, what's the, what's the biggest threat to orangutans? I said, well, it's the, it's the local people. And I think they recognize the value of working with local communities to actually try and save these species. And of course, the Jane Goodall Institute and the Roots and Shoots program has been doing that for decades, where the idea is, you know, the local community aren't the problem. They actually need to be involved in co-creating the solution. Uh, you know, how do you ritual, restore chimpanzee habitat? Well, you've got to make it work financially, economically, ecologically. So really, I sit looking at these two different very different worlds and see the same thing which is someone asking how can we share power in the in the process of basically deciding what action will we take and I think we need questions on or we need data on well, well who was involved and how and those questions are exactly the same whatever the discipline but if we're not standardizing that data in, in machine readable formats it's difficult to compare and I should mention start it as well in Wikidata, actually, it isn't just English language. So because it's Wikidata, it's automatically translated to multiple other languages. So we need to be working outside the Anglophone sphere as well. We need to work across multiple languages. And then you can interrogate that data and go, OK, if you want to involve a local community in this way, which method has the most impacts in this context? At the moment, we can't make those decisions based on evidence because the data isn't there. So the long-term dream of, of Starter is to start to create that data and, you know, we're looking at five to 10 years, really, before we can do something like a living systematic review. But that, that's one of the dreams. Thanks, Jack. We have a question from, from Yala, uh, who would like to hear more about your experiences in 
what data could and has been collected for public health using co-design, um, which he describes as being a very underrepresented field uh, in citizen science? Um, yeah, it's what data could be and has been collected. Um, I'm trying to think of a, of a good example, but let's take it. Let's take air pollution, right? Um, and I like this one because it reminds countries that they're also imaginary, just like Wednesday and uh, and your local county council. We draw these borders. Air pollution, water pollution, and climate change don't recognize these borders. And public health, um, well, we're, you know, we're all quite concerned rightly about COVID at the moment, but air pollution, I think, kills 8 million people a year, or in fact, it did last year. That's a lot of people killed by basically human action. How do we solve that? And I think where public health, citizen science really merge, there's a lot of really great projects around the world. I, I won't name all of them, but there's a lot which are getting people to collect their own air pollution data, getting them to share that in standardized ways, uh, getting that data in the public domain to help evidence informed decision making. Now, of course, there's also conflicting and competing interests. You know, if you were to, I don't know, let's say set up a, a pollution monitoring station right next to a coal power plant, there might be some people with vested interests in coal who maybe aren't as keen to have that data shared or wouldn't necessarily leap at the opportunity to fund that research, if you see where I'm coming from. So I think for me, air pollution is a really great example because it's killing millions of people. We know we need to do something about it, but we don't know what we need to do or how. And also, there's no agreed real way to actually involve people in collecting that data and analyzing it. And I think something like Start It can work with all these different systems to get that data out there and machine readable in, in lots of different formats. But yeah, the big question though, yeah. So we're happy to say more. And uh, Maureen, we have a question from you. Would you like to jump in and, and ask Jack that question? Otherwise I can relay it for you. Um, sure. Um, so you mentioned involving people in all the steps like of the research, like who would be involved when, um, what are we studying? What does a successful outcome look like? Just like all of the details of your research. And I wonder how you ask, like, are you giving people questionnaires with details provided or are you like interviewing people? Um, well, I, I suppose I'd say that it's going back to the paradigm, not a method. So the principle is you should be asking those questions. Uh, the method's up in the air. So, for example, um, public health genomics. Um, this is a really complicated area, right? I mean, probably most people don't have time to sit down and go, now, what are the balances between sharing my genome with the government and the benefit that can do for research versus... Um, possible infringements of privacy, implications for health research, et cetera. Uh, you know, genocide informed by data collected by governments is happening already. What one method for that is something called a citizen's jury. So actually that's where you get, I don't know, 20 members of the public and they're like in a court case, experts make presentations to them and then you ask that jury to deliberate. So that's one really great method to actually ask people what their views and preferences are. But that's maybe not appropriate for everything. You know, sometimes it's a survey. So the idea of start it is, so what I did for my PhD, for example, was I had baseline survey at the start where I asked people their views and preferences and had another survey at the end where I basically asked exactly the same questions. Who do you think should be involved in different stages or different tasks of the research? So a survey is one way of doing it. It's quite a cheap way of doing it. Um, but the other thing we did was online discussions and, and online discussions were much better at getting open-ended discussions going. So participants could raise things and questions that we'd never thought to ask. The, the point of standardized data is once you've got all that data and sometimes very rich qualitative data, you've got a framework to sort of chop it up in a standardized way. And then, so I could compare the qualitative data from different case studies in a standardized way. So I don't know if that answers your, your question, Maureen, but um, hopefully, yeah. Um, if not, let me know. <laughs> so we'll have uh, one last question for, for Jack before we hand it over to Anne to facilitate a discussion. Does anyone else have any other uh, questions that they'd like to, to ask Jack? Well, maybe Jack, I, I might finish on one other one that I 
sort of come up with. I really like this idea of possible, uh, what was it, plausible, preferred and unpreferred futures. And um, at the moment uh, in Victoria, we're you know, starting to uh, put, pull together a citizen science strategy uh, coming out of the state government. And you know, one of the questions that is being asked um, of the working group is, you know, what is our vision of um, a future citizen science future? And, and I'd be keen to hear what your perspectives are on that. Yeah, I mean, so uh, uh, being living in Victoria, there was the Victorians Valuing Biodiversity Report, which was exactly that kind of approach of, um, okay, I work for Vic Forests. Um, I, I've got a contract to supply Japan with office paper for the next 20 years. I value the forest as a commodity to make paper. That's, that's one person's perspective. I like going for walks in the forest. I like breathing clean air. I like having water security. That's how I value the forest. Neither of those people are wrong or right. What we might do is look at how we involve as many people as possible in, an, in, an, in, in as an inclusive way as possible um, in answering the question, how do we value our forests? And, of the, and they did that, the state government, and unequivocally, the results were that we wanted to keep the forests as places to go for mental health. Uh, we wanted to keep them for biodiversity. And, and Pat, correct me if I'm, I'm not quite summarizing this research correctly, but that for me was a fantastic example of, of taking the time to collect that data because there's a really important concept here I only touched on, which is called culturally induced ignorance. And so ag agnotology is the study of culturally induced ignorance. I've got the book here, but there's a book called The Handbook of Ignorance Studies. A really famous example, of course, is tobacco research, right? Where the tobacco companies funded lots of research to say that it doesn't cause cancer. Of course, we know it does. But it took a long time for us to have the evidence to say that because there were enormous vested interests in us not knowing that. So I think part of what we're trying to do with standardized data as well is label who's, who's got vested interests. What are those interests? Or working with the community of people affected by a rare disease. Um, you know, those people said, we're very interested in research into this rare disease because we have it or my children have it. That's, that's not a financial interest, but it's definitely an interest. And it's good to label it because if you've got 17,000 different rare diseases, all of them competing for funding. It's good to be able to say, well, I have an interest in this one. And all of that data can be reported in Start It. And then, you know, so then if you go have someone going, well, I don't think there's any real point to keep old growth forests. You know, you can run machine learning algorithms to go, okay, well, it turns out 100% of industry representatives from, from logging and paper feel this about our trees. The rest of the public feel this. And you can actually begin to weight things with clever statistical analysis, but only if you have that data. Um, but I'm probably getting a bit off topic now, um, but hopefully that answers the question.